Our next speaker will be Nathan Phillips of the Earth and Environment Department at Boston University, who will talk to us about the ecology of the city. I bet you didn't know cities had ecologies, but they do. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. That was really inspiring. Um, I'm supercharged uh, this morning. And uh, Quentin, your remarks as well, I'm going to dovetail right off of them um, because they're great. You know, the, the thought of uh, thinking of our planet like a patient, uh, and it has some real problems that's showing some vital signs that are really troubling. And, and that's the perspective we've been taking in our research uh, at Boston University and with our partners, um, thinking about the city as if it were an organism and thinking about the metabolism uh, of cities. And what we found is there are problems. So, um, and, and we want to know about those problems, but we want to move to solutions. So I'm going to try to kind of cover both of those a little bit and have the perspective as you know, cities are like patients and they got some problems, the, the planet has some problems and, and how do we solve those? So let's see here, uh, point this way, is that right? Okay, um, and so, you know, thinking about uh, the, 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 the city as a, as a kind of a, uh, the metaphor of an organism is not new, um, but it's a lens that could be really powerful and other people are thinking about this as well. Can we learn from nature? Uh, can, can we learn how nature acts in terms of its resilience um, and its efficiency and, and pick up some things from, from nature? You can think of it as kind of a biomimicry uh, uh, in some ways. And so we're, we're thinking about these things. We're learning more and more about um, what nature can teach us. You know, we've created like the internet and we think we, you know, know some things about that. Well, plants and the below ground communities have been doing this for a long time and they have a lot of things to offer us. So really, you know, to think about our planet, it's got systemic problems. We have a metabolic disorder on our planet. Things are going off scale. As, as Adam really pointed out in so many different ways. And I'm not gonna go through the, the uh, details here. You know all of these details. This is from the uh, International Geosphere Biosphere Program that just illustrates how everything is really going off scale. Um, and so taking that uh, you know, metaphor of planetary vital signs having a problems, what do we do? And you know, the, you, you thinking of, as a physician and the Hippocratic Oath, the first thing I want to say is let's stop the bleeding, let's stop the leaking, let's stop the harm, okay? And then we can move from there to the, the restoration stuff that, that Quentin was talking about. And so, you know, let's think about some of the problems we have here in our city. So this is in East Boston, um, and there's a tree that has foliage in the back, um, but the tree in front is dead, and that's due to a gas leak. So we've been, as part of our urban metabolism study, been showing this metabolic disorder um, where here's 70% gas in the soil of that dead tree or that dying tree. There's a couple leaves there. Um, and why is that? Well, it's because the systems that support the city that we live in are old and failing. And so the gas pipelines under our city are back to 1860, 1857 here in the Back Bay, we have this old infrastructure that's failing us. And we need to think about how we address these systems and, and, and restore our, our, our uh, urban ecosystem. Uh, and, and it's led to this kind of uh, problem with gas leaks. So we documented uh, over 3,300 of these gas leaks throughout the city. And so when you think about our green infrastructure, the trees, how many, how much are we compromising, not just the trees, but the soils and the, 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 the all of the green infrastructure, whether it's shrubs or, or grass, whatever in our cities, we have to think about, um, you know, removing that problem that we have. Um, here's a, an example, um, I'm not going to show the video, but this is a newly planted tree in a gas leak. So we have lots of uh, gaps in communication and coordination where we're doing things like we're planting new trees into gas leaks or we are paving new roads um, over hundred year old leaking pipes. Um, we may be a smart city in some ways if we're diligent about 
planting trees, but we can be a very unwise city if we operate without a larger context. Um, and, and so we see things like, similarly, um, a little tree planted into a gas leak here. This is uh, Charlestown Main Street. And by the way, this is brand new pavement here, okay? Um, over over leaking and and there were you know these there were mature trees all along here in front of this school um, and and so here's another problem that that we've had uh, let's see um, you know I've learned from a colleague Bob Ackley who uh, ha he's done gas leak work for 30 years uh, and it, he's I call him an urban naturalist because he, he can read the landscape and see a lot of things that people can't. And it's often what you don't see as, what, as well as what you see that indicates problems. So when you don't see a tree on a street or, you, or you, there's a tree that, uh, street that's devoid of lots of vegetation, um, you know, the damage may already have been done. And that's a situation that we have here where there used to be trees all along here and there's the evidence of the gas leaks both there and here as well. Okay, and really what we need to do is to start thinking more holistically about urban infrastructure, of the interconnections and interdependencies of all of these human built systems. And of course here you're not seeing any green infrastructure um, and, and we need to really start to ramp up the green infrastructure and understand how it can harmoniously work with the built infrastructure that we have. Um, we need to solve um, and address uh, the overpaving of our um, our suburbs and our urban areas. My colleagues Lucy Hutira, Steve Rossidi, and Adrian Finzi at Boston University has do have done this work recently. It, whoops, uh, in uh, in New York, where they've looked at what they call entombed soils. So the soils underneath pavement. And they basically bleed carbon. So the, the, in, in comparison to the soil carbon under, this is just removed so that they could plant trees. But you can see when you remove that and you sample the carbon, how lower the carbon storage is there compared to uh, proximate nearby places, which could be you know, grassy areas and that kind of thing. Uh, the nitrogen cycle is, the nitrogen content is very much different as well. Um, so we have sick, uh, you know, Ecosystems. We, you can think of it as constipated. Uh, you know, there's there's no exchange happening in these these entombed soils. We need to liberate these soils um, and allow the natural processes, including the carbon sequestration, to really take off. So these are you know uh, problems that we have, and so let's move to the solutions, which is what this conference is all about. Okay, we need to unleash the carbon services. Uh, in our city, cities, in our suburbs, um, and even in our, our rural areas. And Adam talked about not only the direct services of carbon sequestration, but things like water services, uh, things like the shading of vegetation on buildings, which can change the carbon uh, needed, uh, the carbon burned uh, to heat and cool buildings. So these direct and direct, indirect uh, benefits of, of uh, carbon farming in urban and, and suburban areas. And the research continues to build to show the potential of this uh, type of activity. And you may have heard out in, uh, in the rangelands, now this is not suburban or, or urban, but some of the principles can still apply. Out in Marin County, uh, there's been an experiment going for nearly a decade now that has shown that by composting on grazing land, the, uh, the carbon benefits of that uh, are dramatic, okay? Um, and it's, I mean, I think that some people have known about this for a long time, but this is kind of, um, you know, uh, really becoming more and more uh, prominent in the research literature. And so Wendy Sil Silver at UC Berkeley, who's been uh, working on this for now close to a decade, calculates that if that compost, that one-time uh, uh, application of compost uh, made from California's green waste were applied to a quarter of the state's rangeland, the soil could absorb three quarters of California's greenhouse gas emissions for one year. Okay, and that, that's, that's due both to the carbon that's accumulating due to that input of compost and it's also due to basically putting our waste to productive use uh, instead of just, you know, sending it off to landfills right now and creating methane. 
more research coming out just uh, last week um, showing similar uh, benefits of carbon accumulation here. Um, this was in the southeastern U.S. Um, and um, one thing I want to point out here uh, from that study that was done and just publishing that these farms, they converted from row crops to intensively grazed lands. Um, and and in, in doing a, a proper maintenance of those lands, these farms were accumulating eight megagrams of carbon per hectare per year. If you compare that to what Harvard Forest is doing, that's about three to four times the annual carbon storage at Harvard Forest. So if we nudge systems, they will respond um, pretty dramatically. They may. Now, that was southeastern U.S., and it was particular to the sites it was done. So it's not that you can guarantee that this is going to happen everywhere, but there is potential. There's, there's large potential for this. Um, I want to finish um, with a larger context um, that, that also builds, again, off of Quentin's comments about you know the framing of how we address climate change. And, the idea of, yes, there's carbon adaptation, there's, carb there's climate adaptation, climate mitigation. Quentin used the word, we need to move beyond that and go to restoration. And I agree totally with that. I actually thought of it in a slightly different way, but I think it's totally consistent. I've kind of come up with this term called adaptigation, okay? Um, and because, why? Why? It's kind of a weird term, but um, the thing is, if you look at the IPCC report, Every single one of those reports separates adaptation from mitigation. So here's the working group on adaptation and, and the impacts and vulnerability, and here's the mitigation, okay? Separated, all right? Separate working groups. You go to the National Climate Assessment of the U.S., mitigation and adaptation are considered separately. When, you, when we consider them as separate things, we think of them as double costs, okay? And I want to, adaptigation as a term to me is really important because I, I've said, well, some things do both at the same time. And, and people will come back and say, yeah, we need to do both adaptation and we need to do mitigation. And what I'm saying is, no, it's not both. There, it's a synergy. Some things actually address both of those at the same time. And carbon farming is one of the things that actually does that. A seawall doesn't. A seawall is adaptation but it doesn't mitigate. In fact, it exacerbates because the seawall is concrete, and concrete is very CO2 intensive. So if we cover our lands with uh, you know, our, our seawalls around the globe, that's really a stimulus package for fossil fuel combustion. Um, whereas if you think about um, you know, the green spaces that we have, um, th this is offering resilience, adaptation, and it's offering the carbon storage services. So this is the Urban Land Institute's uh, visioning of what might happen in the Boston area um, for the ecosystem services against uh, storm surges and things like that in a, in a era of rising uh, sea level. And you know, this is just one example of how carbon farming uh, may benefit the city. Um, and I know that there's a much larger framework here where we're thinking about greening much more of the city and offering those carbon services. So with that, um, I'm going to just uh, end with that comment and let you think about that yourself. So, okay. Thank you.